Today on the Bible Reading Challenge podcast, we are going to give an overview of the book of Ezra Nehemiah, or I guess books, but it's really one scroll. Uh, my name is Aaron Ventura, and I'm joined today again by Pastor Doug Wilson. Pastor Doug, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me back. All right, so this is uh, kind of the sequel to First and Second Chronicles. So right. if people have been going through those lengthy uh, right. books. Well, now you made it to uh, Ezra Nehemiah, which... Right begins the way that Chronicles ends. So why don't you just set the stage for us in terms of what is, uh, where does this fit into the big picture of the history of Israel? And then we'll get into the book itself. Sure. Um, w- one of the things you mentioned that Ezra and Nehemiah were likely one book initially, and it's even possible that Chronicles and Ezra and Nehemiah were all one yeah. book. Um, but even if they weren't part of the same scroll, um, you, what you have is this up and down pattern through Chronicles, um, good kings, bad kings, good kings, bad kings, and you're sometimes actually I was when I started to reflect on it, I was surprised at how many good kings Judah had. Yeah, there was actually a fair amount. <laughs> yeah, actually a fair amount. Um, but you had this up and down pattern, nonetheless, that finally culminates in the destruction of. Jerusalem and the exile, and you have th- – th- this would make Ezra and Nehemiah, if they were all part of the same uh, narrative, as sort of the crowning culmination of restoration and return. Yeah. So what does is, what is real reformation look like after a long pattern of an up-and-down monarchy? Yeah. So uh- – you have notes today, which yeah, uh, for, uh, which, <laughs> which is really rare for the, for those who are wondering. Normally, you don't bring any any no. notes, uh, and we we alluded to this in the Chronicles episode we did we did with Toby about um, the kind of chronology. And you, there's basically two options: there's the believing option and the un- unbelieving option. <laughs> yeah, the good option. And the <laughs> <laughs> so so we're going to set you sh- set you straight here. So so Doug, make use of your notes. Tell us what we what we need to know about the chronology here. Okay, one of the things uh, you have to Basically, uh, you could call them the right and the wrong chronology, or um, uh, if you want to be more descriptive, the long chronology and the short chronology. Yeah. Um, I believe that the short chronology does uh, more justice to the text itself. Uh, oftentimes, even evangelical scholars defer to what archaeologists and historians come up with in their secular timelines, yeah. and then they try to fit the Bible into this secular yeah. timeline. It's kind of like it, fitting evolution into Genesis. Yeah, it's one just somehow, it's just or... not a good plan, <laughs> and it's especially not a good plan when it comes to Egypt. Uh, Egyptian chronologies are no- notoriously uh, tangled. But um, I I just object to the pattern of letting a secular chronology develop an unbelieving the the one that's developed on unbelieving assumptions, yeah. and then you try to fit. Bible ver- Bible passages into that. The difficulty is that some of the passages don't fit. So uh, I take the short chronology, which would make Ezra and Nehemiah uh, and Mordecai and Esther contemporaries. Yeah. The, the, that's a telescoped short chronology. Yeah. Uh, the long chronology uh, spreads it out over basically a century. Yeah. All right. So um, so if you spread it out over a century. Uh, what you what happens is that you run into uh, problems in the text. So, for example, in uh, in Nehemiah uh, twelve, it says, "And his brethren, uh, Shemaiah and Azra- Azrael, Milalai, Gilalai, Mai, Nathaniel, and Judah and Hanan, with the musical instruments of David the man of God, and Ezra the scribe before them." Mm-hmm. And at the fountain gate, which was over against them, they went up by the stairs of the city of David at the going up of the wall above the house of David, even under the water gate eastward. So that's in Nehemiah 12. Well, what's Ezra the scribe doing with the right. – yeah. well, and it's very plain. It's not just Ezra because you could say that's a common name, but this is Ezra the scribe. Yeah. Um, Ezra the scribe, and if you buy into the long chronology, you're going to have to say, well, this is a – this verse has a mistake in it, or the, or the you have to postulate yeah. a scribe, or the error. book is like toggling back and forth in time, where it actually the plain reading would seem to just go in linear. Yeah, it's all, they're all in the same time. And then in um, uh, one of the things that we see in Ezra two one and two, uh, now these are the children of the province that went up out of the captivity 
of those which had been carried away, whom Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon had carried away unto Babylon, and came again unto Jerusalem and Judah, every one unto his city, which came with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah. There are, so Nehemiah, that, that place is Nehemiah as a contemporary of Ezra, and the passage from Nehemiah 12 makes Ezra a contemporary of, of Nehemiah. Uh, Nehemiah, Sariah, Reliah, Mordecai, Okay, well, uh, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mizpar, Bigvi, Rehum, Bana, and I should mention here for those parents interested in Bible <laughs> Bible names need to, need to pay closer attention to <laughs> to Ezra. Yeah. Um, so basically, unless the writer's trying to confuse us, why, why would he um, do this? And then um, in the verse quoted above, the third name after Nehemiah is Mordecai. Uh, why would this not be the name of the Mordecai of Esther um, uh, of Esther ten three? Yeah. How many Jews would have had this Persian name, which means man of Marduk? Yeah. All right, so Mordecai is an unusual Jewish name, and it sort of stands out. Yeah. Ezra is not that unusual, but Ezra the scribe is. Yeah, they're clearly uh, setting it off. They're they're clearly setting it off. So, consequently, I think a commitment to inerrancy commits you to the short chronology. And the and the difficulties, yeah. are the, and there are difficulties uh, because uh, and the and I'll just touch on this. Um, uh, the the difficulty would be the names of the kings. Yeah. All right, so it seems compelling to me. The short chronology seems compelling because of the names of the protagonists: yeah. Ezra, Nehemiah, and then off to the side, Mordecai. If you go with the short chronology, you have to deal with the names of the kings. Mm-hmm. Right, uh, because the kings are described in different ways, um, and I've just resort to my notes. If yeah. we have the difficulty, we have the difficulty of identifying persons who sit on thrones when we have to take account of the fact that these rulers often used throne names. Right, we know this readily in other circumstances. If someone today were to refer to Caesar, a natural question would be which one? Yeah, Augustus or the Caesar, Herods, same or, the, thing. or the Herods, yeah. uh, the same thing. Same thing is true of Pharaoh. Which which Pharaoh? Is a throne name. One of the things we have to deal with is a very real possibility that Darius and Artaxerxes were throne names. Okay, and if Darius and Artaxerxes are throne names, which is not unusual in the ancient world, um, then that resolves a lot of these difficulties. Other throne names in the Bible would be Ben Hadad um, in Jeremiah forty nine uh, forty nine twenty seven Amos one four or Abimelech Genesis twenty twenty six and Psalm thirty four. So. Uh, my assumption is that the shift from Darius to Artaxerxes in Ezra 7 does not represent the reign of a different king, right. but is referring to the same king under a different name. Yeah, and there's various like translations of what those throne titles would mean, which if, if you're tr- – uh, some of it is uh, – we're, we're speculating a little bit. So mm-hmm. da- so some would say Darius basically means like doer, upholder of the good. Xerxes or Ahasuerus, hero among kings, greatest of kings, chief of rulers. And then Artaxerxes, uh, something like kingdom of justice. And you could say, well, why are they using some of these? Wh- why do they use these different names? Right. And so you would maybe suggest that uh, there's some kind of theological import based on what they're doing. Because it does seem uh, there is in the text... Okay, they're going to pause the building. Okay, they're going to go mm-hmm. back and check. And the, okay, now they're going to start Resume. the build, yeah. building again. Um, and it does some really cool stuff when you get to uh, Nehemiah and he's before the king. And then it just has that like line about, oh, and the queen was right there. And yeah. then you're like, oh, that's Esther. That's Esther. Right. Yeah. Um, right. And, it, and it has a high degree of explanatory power for um, why there is so much favor given to them. As we're going to see, like they're going to say yeah. – you uh, you fund it out of the blank check from the king's treasury. Uh-huh. Build what you want, and that would make sense if Esther's the queen. After Esther's the queen, yeah, ab- absolutely. The other thing to keep in mind is these things are really can be confusing to us from to over two thousand years uh, away, yeah. right? Um, but if you've read, ever read um, a novel by Dostoevsky. And you're trying to, <laughs> and you're trying to track. There are all these different Russian names for the same people. And I'm right. reading through this book. And I, uh, now, who's this? <laughs> yeah, you need like a notepad next to it. <laughs> Who, who's this person? Because you've got nicknames, and you know, and the of course the initial readers would have had no trouble with it because yeah. they knew who we, they were talking about. But it can become pretty opaque to us. Yeah. But I think you've got m- more explanatory power 
with the short chronology and fewer confusions, fewer things to have to explain, but not zero. You, you have to explain some things. But if you go the other way, um, you're having to explain away passages that seem to me very, very clear. Yeah. Uh, I don't know who Art- Artaxerxes is for sure, right. but I know who Ezra the scribe is, yeah. and he's really, really old <laughs> at, the, at the end of Nehemiah yeah. under the long chronology. Yeah. Uh, and then can you talk about the prophets? So so Daniel's active somewhere in, in here, right. and then there's also a couple prophets who are going to show up on the scene. Right, so right. Uh, we situate uh, Haggai and Zechariah yeah. in in Ezra and Nehemiah as well. So um, they, basically, they are uh, prophetic voices off to the side. They're, they're, they are the ones who are uh, uh, giving the attaboys, come on, you can do it, <laughs> yeah. sort of prophecies, or why is this work languishing? Why are you letting this um, work falter? Right. Um, so they are all part of the same reconstruction project. Yeah. Um, and and so, uh, and at different times it languishes. So it, it, it they don't go back to Jerusalem and build it all in one go, mm-hmm. right? They um, they build the altar first, and then they you know it, they they struggle over a long period of time, and they need encouragement and or rebuke. Yeah, right. Uh, one of the things that I've uh, noticed talking to people who are uh, either in the Bible reading challenge or just. Re- trying to read through the Bible, as soon as you kind of get to the minor prophets or just the prophets in general, it's super confusing about right. what's mm-hmm. happening when. How have you tried to sort those things in your mind so that when you get to the book, you don't always have to constantly, you know, look at look something <laughs> up to know who's it talking about? Um what advice would you give to people as they're just trying to yeah. have categories for trying to place this all in a coherent timeline? One, one of the bits of advice is don't, don't make the mistake of thinking that the prophets, major prophets and minor prophets, are chronological. Um, Malachi is, right near, is, is chronologically um, right near the end of the Old Testament period. Yeah. Um, and it also happens to be last in the um, – uh, you know, last in our canonical order, but it'd be easy for people to assume that Isaiah, Jeremiah, all come earlier, yeah. and then all the minor prophets are, later, are yeah. and it's just a, a false assumption. Shake loose of that assumption. The, these books are grouped according to length. Yeah. Uh, major prophets have to do with the size of the book, not the earliness of the prophecy. Yeah. So if you, uh, and then if you can peg minor prophets to certain events earlier that will help, like Haggai and Zechariah being pegged to the events of Ezra and Nehemiah's time, Um, and just use basically use that as your structuring device. Um, And and, and I found it helpful to, to, um, like if you're reading through Chronicles and you get to the reign of King Ahaz, okay, this is Isaiah 7's Ahaz. Yeah. All right. So Isaiah, and I, okay, and I know Isaiah is roughly 700 BC, yeah. and I, I, I attach him to a king. And that basically, if you have a, a rough set of bookshelves mm-hmm. built and you, and you hang certain prophets uh, on them, yeah. then you're going to be okay. Yeah. <laughs> I think I found it helpful to think through, like, can I just walk through in my head? the story of the Bible and just like major events, like, you know, creation and then the exodus or the right. flood or whatever in order. And it seems helpful to ha- use the exile right. as, uh, you know, having pre-exilic prophets, guys who are during the exile yeah. uh, uh-huh. and then post-exilic. And that's kind of an easy way of breaking th- that down. If you want to just write those out for yourself, maybe memorize them. And then, and then you can distinguish who's prophesying against Assyria when they fall, who's prophesying against Babylon when they fall? And then there's right. some other ones against other nations. But right. uh, we sympathize with everyone. It's hard. <laughs> yes, we feel, you, we feel your pain. Another, another helpful thing, depending on – this might make it worse in the case of some people, but it might really be a help. And that is um, the period that we're talking about, so the decree of Cyrus mm-hmm. to rebuild. Um, Cyrus reigned from 539 to 530. And remember, BC, yeah. the dates go backwards. <laughs> so Cyrus it starts in 539, and Artaxerxes Longamanus reigned up until 425 BC. 
Okay, so that's roughly the time period we're we're talking about. Yeah. Um, that period uh, from 529 to 425. During this time, the Greeks defeated the Persians at the Battle of Marathon, yeah. and um, and the Battle of Salamis. Um, Pericles reigned in Athens. The Greek tragedians flourished. Socrates taught. Uh, Cincinnatus was dictator in Rome, and the Buddha and Confucius both lived and died. Oh wow! Okay, <laughs> so the, that was a hopping time. Yeah, that, that was a hopping time. <laughs> and so if you if you say, oh, um, the the Persians, well, that's uh, Esther is the queen of the Persian Empire, yeah. and you may have learned about the collision between the Greeks and the Persians yeah. to the west, uh, and it may it was a really significant set of battles, Marathon and Salamis, um, to, in Western history, it may have been less significant for the Persians, right? Yeah. right? Uh, but Esther may have been, oh, we have some bad news. Huh? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just barely made it into the Twitter feed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, um, well, as I was thinking about Old Testament books and their applicability to the to where we are right now, right. Uh, so we tend to easily read Paul's letters. It's New Testament. It seems a lot closer to uh, to us. Uh, but Ezra and Nehemiah is a very analogous time to where we're living in, in kind of a, a post Christendom, right. although we would say pre Christendom 2.0 right. world. Uh, and so, what I wanted to do is kind of approach uh, this book, these books as a kind of manual for Reformation right. and revivals. You, you wrote a book, Rules for Reformers. Reformers. And I guess you could write like a volume two just on Ezra, just lessons on, from, just from on, this right. book. That's exactly right. So I'm going to just rattle off. I've just got kind of like seven heads, and we kind of did this with Proverbs, just uh, looking at it thematically. And I thought we'd talk about each of these um, it, from this book. So uh, kind of a manual for Reformation and Revival. One would be establishing pure worship. Right. Um, so that, that's a top priority. Haggai's going to get on them for that. Uh, there's a theme of earnest prayer. Both Ezra and Nehemiah have these lengthy prayers. Uh, repentance for sin. So there's pagan intermarriage, a usury, a self-interest. Uh, number four, uh, public instruction from the word. So the great uh, mm-hmm. reading in, in Nehemiah 8. And then building infrastructure while there is uh Threats, war, uh, physical intimidation. Mm-hmm. Also, you have God's blessing, God fa- God's favor on the building projects, even working through the government, and the kings to to allow them to go and do that. And then the last one, I have uh, courageous leadership. So that took a lot mm-hmm. of courage for them. Um, and there's some great stuff here. Courageous, on, and, courageous, and visionary. Yeah, and yeah. And, and visionary. Um, so I thought let's just let's just start with number one, pure worship. So. Right. That's a priority. What lessons can we draw from these books for today? Yeah. So, um, d- zoom out for just a minute. I, I'm fond of thinking of Ezra as the first Pharisee. Um, and Pharisaism, I think, was a movement that was noble in its beginning, mm-hmm. and noble and good and right and necessary. Uh, if we were rummaging around in English, a le- English lexicon for a comparable word, both in meaning and history, the word would be Puritan. Yeah. Uh, so the early Puritans were really something. And then later on, in later centuries, it degenerated into Unitarianism or, or, or censorious type of pinched face Puritanism. But early, it wasn't like that. Uh, so I'm thinking of Ezra as the first Pharisee. He was a scribe. He was dedicated to the law of God. He uh, dedicated himself to that in uh, this pagan empire. So he's studying the law of God with no apparatus, yeah. <laughs> right? There's no temple. There's no. Um, he's reading about the heifer and no heifers, and he's uh, he learns it all from books. Yeah. But then, at the first opportunity, they go when they're allowed to go back. They return from exile, and the first thing that they want to do before they build the walls, before they do anything else, is they want to reestablish right worship. Yeah. And because, because Ezra was very aware from the prophets that the reason they were exiled in the first place was because of the corruption of worship. Yeah. So back in the days when they had a temple, uh, they blocked it up, they neglected it, then Hezekiah re- restores the worship of the temple. It's this up and down thing. So the people made had made Yahweh angry by corrupting their worship of him or neglecting their worship of him or veering off to other gods entirely, 
or worshiping other gods on the side. All of those things were the reason why they were taken into exile. And it's quite striking that the Babylonian exile really did fix that problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, <laughs> they learned their lesson. <laughs> they learned the lesson, and the Jews never returned to rank idolatry again. They fell into other problems, yeah. right? But they, they got another problem. They killed the Messiah, so that, that was not good. <laughs> that, yeah, that, that was not a, good, not a good thing. But they were uh, zealous in their hatred of images. And, yeah. And, um, so the... I, I think the human race, the Jews in the Old Testament, and the hu humans generally are like the duffel puds in <laughs> in Voyage of the Dawn Treader. We learn very, very slowly, achingly slowly, yeah. one thing at a one thing at a time. So I think that um, basically the restoration of pure worship against the backdrop of the exile happening in the first place because of corrupted or neglected worship mm -hmm. was the was the central. Uh, lesson. Yeah, and if we go back to when Elijah is saying, God, I'm the only one, but the Lord says, now there's a remnant, right. uh, there is a much larger faithful remnant. And, and yeah. by the t even by the time you come to Jesus' day, there's there's a good group of them who tr right. who truly are waiting for the Messiah, who are faithful and blameless. Right. Um, you know, Zechariah would be one of those well, people. And then you see in, in Hezekiah's reign, he sends an invitation up to Israel and says, come back to the worship of Yahweh. Come and observe the Passover with us. And it says a lot, bunch of the people laughed, them, laughed and scoffed, but a handful of people from different tribes came and yeah. and participated in the Passover. Yeah. Uh, Ezra 7 is this really, this is kind of the letter that every pastor wants to receive from the president. And this is, <laughs> you know, where he basically says, you need to go back to the land, teach, you need to teach the law right. and we'll provide all you need for the sacrifices right. and stuff. And what's really interesting is that the king says, like, you need to do this lest God's wrath be upon us. Right. And this was something uh, during the Reformation time in, in arguments between Protestants yeah. and Catholics that we are going to upset God if we, if we are committing idolatry. Right. And it's actually an issue of national security yeah. and it's, to yes. have true worship. So that's very foreign to us. Right. Um, so how should we think about this government church relationship when we typically as Protestants are not in favor of supporting first table offenses by the magistrate. Right. right? And, uh, and that uh, is, that sort of goes without saying in our circles and it shouldn't go without saying. We, we should have to have a discussion about first table issues. And one of the lessons of Ezra and Nehemiah is that we have to be far more precise and scrupulous in our thinking and simultaneously less fastidious. And, and, and here's part of the tracking thing. When you look at, um, look at Israel and Egypt, what you have are pagan overlords and Israelites underneath them, and the Israelites are just simply slaves. Okay? So pagan overlords and slavery. Um, you have a glimpse of what's to come when Joseph was reigning in Egypt, but it, it's a very brief time, at least in the text. Then you move into the conquest of Canaan, and the relationship of God's people there to pagan to, um, is that of enemy combatants. Mm -hmm. So Israel's here, the pagan kings are there, and we're at war with them. Yeah. And so you have centuries of warfare against pagan kings, and, um, and then when the exile happens, it introduces something that lasts – through the time of the New Testament um, in the text, there's a brief respite in the Apocrypha in Maccabees. But what this is, is a the people of God under pagan overlords, but in more of a cooperative yeah. uh, thing. It's not, it's not like – it's not adversarial like it was with Moses against Pharaoh because when Cyrus issues the decree to go build the temple in Jerusalem, he's a pagan and he d did that – for a bunch of other temples in other parts of the empire, mm -hmm. he wanted all the gods. <laughs> <laughs> he wanted all the people of all the gods yeah. to be praying for him. Okay, and he he includes the temple of Yahweh in it. And Ezra and others know where the line is on how much I can cooperate, how much I can ride on these coattails, and how much I can't. So um, 
there's a place where Ezra refuses to ask for an armed escort yeah. because he was ashamed yeah. to ask for that. He didn't want to ask for that because yeah. he, he And they did. had a lot of gold going with them, so you right. need to, you need the Secret Service with you. <laughs> yeah, let's take a caravan <laughs> with lots of gold through the wilderness area. What could go wrong? Yeah. Um, but Ezra refuses to – he takes help in so, certain respects and doesn't take help in others. Yeah. Um, so you have this you, with, um, with the Persians and then all the way through the New Testament, you've got a similar um, setup with Rome. Yeah. So the Apostle Paul is a Roman citizen. He appeals to Rome. He uses the Roman legal um, yeah. system to fight for certain things. And there's a brief time under Maccabees. So you had uh, – the Maccabean brothers, uh, uh, Judas and and then Jonathan and then Simon, who fought for, to, who fought to carve out uh, the right to practice the law, yeah. but they're carving it out in a region where there's all, all the pagan, um, the pagan uh, forces are very much dominant and controlling, yeah. and so the Jews carve out a place where they can worship God according to the law, yeah. um, and that's what Christians seek to do in the New Testament. So th this would be, um, the lesson would be, um, because we're very much in this same situation. We're interested in pure worship. We want to establish and protect pure worship. The secular society around us is pagan. All of their assumptions are pagan. We need to know when to cooperate with what they are willing to give us and when to say no. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, um, that's a delicate balance. Yeah, and, and no state licensed churches. No state licensed <laughs> churches. But if let's let's say uh, let's say I get arrested for preaching through Leviticus. Yeah. Um, if I get arrested, I'm going to use free speech arguments. Yeah. Right. I'm going to use free speech arguments, but I'm not going to apply for a license. So right. uh, before you can preach through Leviticus, you get you need to get a Leviticus license. No, <laughs> I'm not going to. Get, no, I, that's something I would refuse to do. Because like Ezra, I'd be ashamed to do that. Right. But at the same time, I would be willing to use legal arguments when the when the Jews are shut down, mm -hmm. uh, the people resisting them write letters to the uh, to the emperor, yeah. and then the Jews write letters to the emperor. You know, there's yeah. a lot of back and forth. Yeah. Uh, so let's get to a probably one of the messiest pastoral issues of marriage, divorce, remarriage yeah. question. Yeah. So uh, Westminster Confession says there's basically two. Uh, legal grounds for mm. divorce, adultery, and right. uh, abandonment or willful desertion. I think I think it says uh, the Jew, uh, the Jews have a problem right. uh, historically right. <laughs> with marrying uh, pagans, and here they go through this whole divorce uh, as saga as a part of purifying the people. And so for, for a lot of us Christians, we think that's very unchristian. It violates first Corinthians seven, uh, where Paul says mm -hmm. that the unbelieving spouse is sanctified. So can you explain why it was actually right for them to do yeah. it then, but it would be wrong for us to do the same thing? Okay. Now? I, I, I would, um, question the second half of that. So it was right it was right for them to do it and I would say under the sim, sim, same or similar circumstances it would be right for us to do it. Okay. Um, so uh, it, one there's a, a little comment there where it's it's not that the Jews had married um, a decent Buddhist woman you know um, it th these were they were intermarrying with Canaanites or the people who were part of the remnants of Canaanitic religion. And Canaanitic religion was vile, right? So, uh, and, and Ezra says that these wives with their detestable practices, okay? So, if let's say you had a scenario in, in Ezra where one of the foreign women who was married um, had the demeanor and outlook of Ruth. And she said, your God will be my God where you go, I will go, you know. I don't think she would have been put away, okay. right? Um, the the women who were married in Ezra were guilty of Canaanitic, Canaanitic, worship, Canaanitic worship, which they would not abandon, mm -hmm. and which included all sorts of sexual defilement. Mm -hmm. So ancient pagan religion uh, was not – simply thinking different thoughts in your head, or I'm a pantheist and you're a monotheist. Yeah. It, wasn't, it wasn't that simple. So if, 
let, let's say fast forwarding to uh, Corinth um, in in Paul's letter, the question comes up: Do sh- if I'm married to a pagan, should I divorce him? Um, and Paul says, no. You, if you're married to an unbeliever and they're willing to be um, soon you to chaos, the word. If they're pleased to be together with you, then stay where you are. But if the the unbelieving spouse was the woman, and let's say she also wanted to serve as a prostitute in the temple of Aphrodite, then the other uh, allowance for divorce would pertain, right? right? So, um, and you wouldn't you wouldn't divorce her simply for being a pagan mm-hmm. or thinking thinking pagan thoughts. You would divorce her for uncleanness. Okay. And I think something very similar to that is going on in Ezra okay. because you're, they're, they're wanting to protect the seed yeah. of the, the holy seed. It's all, it's all about protecting the line. And if you're, married, uh, if you're married to an immoral woman, you don't know who the father is. You don't, mm-hmm. There's no telling. Yeah. One of the ways that I was thinking about this, and you could tell me if you if you disagree or have different thoughts on this. So in Le- in Leviticus, I think it's 21, um, <clears throat> the laws for the priests are different for who they can marry than everyone yes. else. And it seems that that is the focus here, that it's the priestly class that is only allowed to marry a virgin from their right. Right. people have intermarried clearly with people not. Right. So it seems like you're solving the problem by saying that uh, – Adultery is probably built in. There's some kind of uncleanness that's built into right. the worship. Uh, I think that's. I think that's probably true. I wonder if they are also thinking of we actually have to keep this law by either kind of annulling these marriages in a certain sense. Mm-hmm. They're, they're putting them away. Um, but in the new covenant, when Paul is arguing in First Corinthians seven, he's saying now holiness goes the other direction. Correct. Whereas yes. under there, they were being made unclean, so they couldn't actually serve uh, in the in the temple. Right, right. So I, I think it's true that in the new covenant, holiness becomes contagious. Mm-hmm. In the old covenant, unholiness was contagious. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Uh, okay, so let's talk a little bit about prayer. And uh, so Ezra 8, Ezra 10, Nehemiah 1 are all uh, really great prayers to God, right. and you have, uh, and Daniel does the same thing, certain kinds of corporate confessions. Uh, could you talk about the way uh, we sh- we both do that individually, but then also as the church, either in our worship, how have we sought to do that here at Christ Church? Yeah, yeah. so uh, one of my favorite prayer passages is the king asked Nehemiah, "What's why the downcast? And I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said, so... Um, you asked a question and you offer the prayer up and answer. Um, uh, it's just a great response. One of the things we we have sought to do in following the instructions of the New Testament, which I believe are riding on the back of some of these things, uh, we're, we're to offer up prayer for kings and all those who are in authority. Um, this is what Cyrus wanted, right? If Cyrus told us that we could build our church, he would say, this is the deal, I'll, you know. I'll let you go back and build your church, yeah. but just pray for me, all right? Yeah. Um, and I would, even if I know that he asked a, he asked the other gods to pray for him too. Yeah. I would still pray for him that he would uh, that he would uh, have a peaceful reign, that God would extend his life, that he would come to a knowledge of the truth, mm-hmm. because that's what Paul's after in Timothy. Yeah. Pray for kings and all those in authority, because God wants all to come to a knowledge of the truth. All yeah. he wants peasants up to the kings to come to this knowledge of the truth. So um, this, the framework of under slavery in Egypt, then at war with the pagan tribes, pagans over there, people of God over here, and then the people of God in a uh, situation where the pagan overlords are, we're cooperating in some respects and resisting in other respects. Mm-hmm. That's where I think we are yeah. currently. And I think that Ezra uh, in the model of prayer in Ezra and Nehemiah um, gives us the model for why I should pray for the current occupant of the White House. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about infrastructure. So uh, I think Aaron Wren calls it owned space. Yeah. Uh, and so we don't have now that, you know, John four, we worship in spirit and truth. So we, we don't have a physical geographic center of the world. Uh, we are, we are that right. center now, but 
tactically in order to have all of Christ for all of life for all of the world, uh, we, we, we do expect to own, to own things uh, right. and, and to even build, in this case, cities, places of, of ref, refuge, cities of refuge. Um, what would you say to someone who has the mindset that we are merely sojourners here? We're, we're elect exiles. Right. And we should just seek the prosperity of Babylon while we're here. How do we harmonize some of those ideas with what we see here with a, a clear uh, vision for, for building so that the kingdom can actually flourish? Yeah. So uh, I think you balance those two things by keeping them in perspective in your mind. So everything we build here, everything – is scaffolding. So if I I could I could uh, build a brick church, a stone church that that would remain standing for 750 years, but it's still just scaffolding because um, uh, when the when the everything is made new, um, I don't think I don't think certain things are going to make it, yeah. and I'm I'm not banking on um, church a church building that we're currently in the process of trying to build, yeah. um, I don't believe that it's going to go to heaven with us. <laughs> uh, <laughs> when it dies, it also goes to heaven. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, if someone says, what are you doing that for? You, um, you're just a pilgrim. Yeah. I would say, yeah, it's just a pilgrim too. Mm-hmm. But this is uh, – I'm just a pilgrim, but I still have a house. I still keep – I still want to – Keep the rain off, right? <laughs> right. Um, now, one of the things that it does, one of the things that a, a church, a classic historic church, does, is the same thing our lives should do, and that is it should testify yeah. to the eternal. To, um, when when I walk into a, I walked into a number of Gothic cathedrals. When I'm talking to a saintly old Christian who's about to go to be with the Lord, one of the things I come away with talking to him is this world is not my home. Peter says that live your lives as pilgrims in this. Yeah. Um, but when you go into a, a well-built Gothic cathedral, you don't get the idea this world is my home. It's this world is not my home, right? It's it's pointing to something outside the world. Yeah. Uh, the, um, and that's what a, a church, a well-built church is going to do. It's going to testify the same way a, a godly saint is going to testify, this is not my home. Now, the the other thing about it, and you 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 used the word uh, tactically earlier, and because I think there's an important thing here, if you took the theology of the mainstream denominations, you know, with their friendliness to LGBTQ stuff and their apologies to plants, you know, <laughs> yeah. we're, we're saying sorry to the plants of the world, and you just took all of that. Farrago of nonsense yeah. that they occupy gave it all to them, but then took all their buildings away. Mm-hmm. Right, took all the historic denomination. Took the, a bunch of that nonsense is going on in tall steeple churches. Yeah. Well, and you said we would like you to to uh, build a religious movement just on the strength of what you're saying and teaching, and you don't have the buildings. Yeah. They wouldn't be able to do it. They would just be fringe kooks, yeah. right? They, um, because what happens is liberalism is parasitic. Um, the, the the buildings and denominations that they occupy uh, were built by believers, um, and and liberalism unbelief is parasitic. It eats out. Um, it it destroy, kills the host, and then the last thing is the fossil, the the stone the stone building. That's the last thing that remains. Um, and even there, um, the you can get a book by the founder of that church, and you open the book, and this world is not my home. And then you look at the building, and you say, yeah, this world's not my home. That's that's really true. But that's no reason for us not to build and, and um, because we want everything to testify. Yeah. It seems like it, it is frustrating that – Conservatives make nice things for the liberals to have later. Why don't we see more liberals build, or at least either conservatives taking back some of these uh, places of infrastructure that have been captured? And is that a worthwhile fight for us to 
try to go in. I mean, like I know a guy, uh, a pastor who went into the Episcopal Church. I, I believe that was his conviction. Right. That, uh, 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 and he went in to try to reform the Episcopal Church. I don't know that it, it succeeded. Right. But at least I thought, oh, okay, that's a worthwhile pursuit yeah. for someone who holds sure. to that conviction. So wh- where are those places? When is it worthwhile for us to actually try to do that? Um, I would say that you need to know your – onions. <laughs> you, you you can't just say, oh, I'm going to take it back for Jesus. You you have to have, I think, direction from God and a significant amount of mojo with, with you. Because once they've captured something, they know how to get, well, if I move up through the ranks, eventually I'll become Archbishop of Canterbury and then I'll fix everything. <laughs> well, no, by the time you get to that point, they'll have so much dirt on you. Mm-hmm. They'll have so many handles and ways to manipulate you. You're not going to be able to get anything done. Yeah. So if if your involvement there actually stood a chance of success, they would run you out. Mm-hmm. And would you say the same thing is true of Christians who are tired of voting for politicians that they don't want to vote for, and so they like, I want to run for office, or I want to try to do that. Um, is that something you would encourage, or is it just like, all right, just just keep it real <laughs> with what you actually can accomplish? Yeah, I would say keep. Uh, I would encourage that on a local level, mm-hmm. yeah, if uh, county and city, and uh, I think that's that's a place where you can actually get feedback that tells you what how you were actually doing. Mm-hmm. Um, I wouldn't try to build anything nationally unless God get, just gave it to you. Mm-hmm. If you were uh, if you're some sort of rock star who gets saved and you already have a platform, right. then use it. Yeah. But anybody who tries to build a platform of national reformation mm-hmm. in a country of 330 <laughs> million people, starting from scratch, they are, they are bound to be disappointed. Yeah. I, 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 I think you need a word from the Lord to do that. Yeah. And uh, that word from the Lord might come in a vision, a dream, uh, a word yeah. from the, this podcast. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, okay. I want to talk about building while your adversaries are attacking you. Yeah. And you could kind of look at this as a adversary's playbook. Yeah. So we get to see, uh, Paul says, of the devil. We are not ignorant of his devices. And we have some of their devices uh-huh. here. Uh, we have kind of uh, first in Ezra 4, they try to build with you. Yeah. <laughs> say, oh, let us come. Yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll help you out. We'll help. Um, mm-hmm. And then they, when when you say no, then they they call the authorities on you. Right. They threaten your. They tell the king they're going to become a tax exempt uh, place. Right. Not, so w- because we care about the common good, right. you don't want this rebellious city. Uh, and they'll send uh, threats. They'll try to get you. They try to get Nehemiah to go into the temple so they'll have some dirt on him. So, uh, Doug, you've been attacked over the years. Uh, what lessons from Ezra yeah. Nehemiah have you taken to heart, and yeah. and what are some that we can as, as Christians? Well, that uh, that was very astute, pointing out those different things that they use. It, it's very plain that they do them. Um, and it's very plain that they are just trying to uh, get in the way because it's striking that uh, Ezra and Nehemiah don't take help from the Canaanitic pagans, mm-hmm. and they do from the emperor yeah <laughs> the, um so what's you hip the, you hypocrites uh, yeah. uh, well it, it's very clear to me that the issue is strategic and tactical mm-hmm. right and that's what i meant earlier about we need to be really precise about our worship uh, you know puritans mm-hmm. and at the same time not fastidious so, such that oh i can't talk to you because yeah it's going to get messy. It's going to get messy, and it's supposed to get messy. And you have to understand who is safe to take help from, and who is not to say who is not safe to take help from. Right. Right. Um, so, uh, and it's very clear that these people locally, they're like uh, arguing with a non-Christian. Where did Cain get his wife? And you start to answer it, and then you realize. He's he's not listening. He's just thinking up his ne- next objection. Yeah. As soon as I tell him, he's going to say, "But what about this next thing? What about this?" Um, if if I were to answer your question, would you become a Christian? Mm-hmm. No. No. <laughs> well, let's talk about something. Else. Let's yeah. talk about something else then. It's very clear that they're going to move through. The, not only do they say, um, "Can we help?" No. Then they report them. They're 
parking violations yeah. or zoning <laughs> violations, are that then they're going to stop paying taxes. It's a threat to your revenue, uh, and they're, they're going to re- part and parcel with that is they're going to revolt. Uh, these people are extremists. Yeah. They are Second Amendment nuts. They're yeah. going to arm themselves and disrupt the empire. And some of these slanders work, yeah. right? Because the, or at least to work enough to delay. Um, yeah, things. they do get the king to press pause right. on it, right? Right. Now, the thing – I would say the thing that uh, – probably the central lesson uh, I've learned in in dealing with this sort of thing is someone's going to say, if you say that, then you're going to be slandered as saying this. I know you don't believe this, but they're going to say you believe this because you did that thing or said that thing or mm-hmm. wrote that thing. Um, and I think our answer should be let them. Right, uh, we tend to think that slander is one hundred percent effective. Mm-hmm. Okay, but it's not one hundred percent effective, as uh, Haman found out. For for, for example, you, the, there really are turns in the story. Yeah, and so the king looks looks things up, and then he he goes back and comes back to the Canaanites and says, "Not only you offered to help earlier, but." Now you really have to help. Yeah. Right? You really have to help. So that's – and, and then they would receive it. The Jews would receive it. Yeah. So what you have to do is realize that slander is not automatically 100 percent effective. Mm-hmm. Jesus says when you're slandered, when you're despitefully used, when men say all manner of evil things against you, in that day rejoice and be exceedingly glad. So we should – Understand that when we've risen to the level of needing to be slandered, that is a progress report. Mm -hmm. We're making headway. Yeah. The anti-aircraft fire tells you that you're over the target. Yeah. Seems like a lot of uh, when when you get into these kind of tussles, uh, your heart's inclination is to go, "Yikes! This is heat that I I don't like." And there's a certain sense in which as we encounter that, whether that that is as simple as you're talking to your parents or in some of your cases where it's a blog kind of yeah. firestorm saying, I should be encouraged by this. I think Paul Correct. says um, there's an open door there. I forget. I forget where. And there's there's great opposition. But that's an yeah. he sees that as an open door. And yeah. so a lot of it is training our eyes of faith to see the opposition as encouraging. Oh, we must be – Yes, the devil's hitting back. We must be getting to him. And uh, one of the things that people forget is that conflict is uh, – although it's no fun. If you if you want to live a p- quiet and peaceful life, as Paul tells us we should <laughs> pray for, yeah. uh, and that's your inclination, you would rather not be in it all the time. Uh, nevertheless, you should recognize that conflict is interesting <laughs> and um, – and oftentimes the conflict means that people are now paying attention to you, which you should say, oh, oh, oh gospel. I can – one time years ago, I was um, – I went over to WSU to do some open-air preaching. And it was – it's when you go to church to preach, the people all, – all the people there more or less came to hear you. But when you're open air preaching, nobody came to hear you. <laughs> nobody asked for this, and so it's always like going a little bit like going off a high dive. Yeah, right. So I got over there, and and I I was not all that experienced in it, and it was drizzling, overcast and drizzling, and I started saying, oh, it's, I'm not going to be able to get a crowd, and uh, uh, no, I drove over here, so I should <laughs> I should do it. So I back and forth, and so I got up and started to preach. And then there was a communist nearby who was selling Maoist news, newspapers. What, he, what year was this? This was, <laughs> this was probably 78 okay. or so. <laughs> um, and he jumped in and tried to start shouting me down, this communist. And instantly, a crowd, boom, like 100 people, yeah. I, whatever it was. And he would yell at me, and then I would answer him and present the gospel. And then he would yell, and then I would answer him and present the gospel. And conflict is interesting. Mm-hmm. And if you keep your cool, if you don't lose your head, if you realize, okay, this is this too is in the sovereign hands of God. Yeah. God used the pagan empire, and God used the local Canaanite opposition mm-hmm. to help God's people accomplish their purpose. Yeah. But if they had lost their tempers, or if they panicked, mm-hmm. or if they had surrendered. Or if they'd accepted help too quickly, if they'd done any of those things, yeah. it would have really disrupted the project. Yeah, when you read church history books, it's all our favorite characters, all our favorite stories are ones with a lot of 
conflict yeah. in it. And at the same time, you're like, hmm, it might not have been fun to actually have been right. to have been Tyndale or to have been any of these, right. these great men. Uh, I thought we'd uh, finish by just talking about this category of courageous leadership. So we have uh, Zerubbabel, we have Jeshua the high priest, we right. have, of course, Ezra, Nehemiah. Uh, what are some lessons that we can take from these figures, the way God has uh, used them to bring about this reformation? Yeah. Um, not, I've I'm not. Uh, I don't usually quote Napoleon approvingly, but uh, Napoleon once said, "Imagination rules the world," and I would say the biblical phrase for that would be, "Faith rules the world." First um, John says, um, "What is it that overcomes the world? Is it not our faith?" Yeah. And uh, so, what what you see with Nehemiah, he's a cupbearer to the king, and Jerusalem is in shambles. And he sees an opportunity there um, and wants to do something about it. Ezra sees an opportunity where all, basically wh- one man would see rubble, another man sees opportunity. And uh, so the courage, uh, C.S. Lewis says somewhere that courage is not so much a separate virtue as it is the testing point of all the virtues. So if you have faith and you see what could be and that sort of thing, you could be really learned like Ezra was. But it's not going to come to the testing point unless you have the courage to actually step out, right? Um, and uh, Nehemiah does the same thing. He steps out, and he doesn't take he doesn't take the same kind of salary that others take. Um, he is um, he's courageous to the point of testing, right? Uh, or, or he's visionary or faithful to the point of testing, which is where the courage comes in. So the courage or valor has to do with main, remembering in the dark what you knew in the light. When you had it all figured out, this was the plan, and then I get into the deep weeds. I get into this thing, and people are yelling at me, and yeah. uh, uh, I hear reports of armed marauders coming, and and so Nehemiah has the people building with a sword in one a sword on one hand and yeah. trowel on the other. Uh, they took the threats seriously. Um, but they were prepared to fight. They, yeah. they knew what they were going into. Yeah, it's interesting when you read, uh, especially Nehemiah, at the very end of the book. So he, so he sets things in order. He returns to the king, and then he goes back, and they've already mm-hmm. like screwed things up yeah. again. I think, he, I think he chases someone or smacks smacks yeah. some, somebody, <laughs> pull their hair. <laughs> yeah, uh, and it it kind of seems that even. You know, even they're doing this great work of reformation and and reviving the worship that they themselves don't have this sense of great satisfaction and accomplishment or even approval from the people because they're saying, he's saying, uh, God, remember, you, remember what I've done. Like right. these people don't know they're, they're liars. They're, right. they're unfaithful, but there's this plea that God, Re- remember me. Yeah. Remember yeah. me. These works are being done before your face. Even if these other people <laughs> right. are, are messing right. everything up. And I find that very encouraging as, you know, often how many uh, figures in church history like Abraham died not seeing the promise or yeah. died before, in Tyndale's case, before the king of England's eyes were opened. Right. And, and, and that's, a, that's a feature, not a bug, where, where God wants us to die looking forward to things that have not yet been uh, attained, but that we contribute to. Yeah. So you plant trees that you won't ever see full down. Yeah. That's what faith does. <laughs> well, up next, we have the book of Job. Until next time, keep on reading.